Hi everyone, welcome to Newegg TV. My name is Paul and today we have a build video for you guys and uh, this is going to be the mini mobile gaming PC. This is actually a combo that we've put together on Newegg.com and uh, for the first time we've actually gathered all the parts here for the combo. Uh, I'm going to, in this video, be kind of walking you guys through the assembly of all these parts. Uh, the combo is available right now for purchase on Newegg.com so you can check out the video description below if you'd like to find a link over to that. If you're viewing this at some uh, point in the future, the combo might not still be available, but hopefully this will still remain as a sort of a tutorial for, for building a small form factor computer, because that's what it is. It's a mini ITX based uh, gaming PC. It's a little bit more in the budget range, but it's also very small and portable, hence the name mobile gaming PC, mini mobile gaming PC. Yeah. So let's go over the parts for this build. This is an AMD based build and we're going with an FM1 socket processor. That's this one right up here. This is the A83870K processor. It is an APU accelerated processing unit from AMD, which means it's got the CPU in there as well as a GPU. It's a 6550D GPU that's integrated onto the processor itself. Also, this is a K SKU, which means it is overclockable. Uh, next up, of course, we have our motherboard. This is an ASRock A75M, I, A, A75M ITX, mini ITX motherboard. Very small, uh, but it's got a lot of cool features on there, including uh, six, uh, SATA 6G, uh, as well as, of course, a full-length PCI Express slot for our, our graphics card. Graphics cards over here on the right. This is an MSI R7770 graphics card, DirectX 11 capable, uh, a lot of power for the price with this video card. And uh, that's sort of the basis of our system. We, of course, also have memory, a nice dual channel memory kit here from G-Skill. Uh, we're going with eight gigs, uh, four gigs per stick. It's gonna allow us to use dual channel feature of the motherboard, and that uh, should give us plenty of memory for uh, gaming or for computing use. We also have a slim DVD drive right here. And that is because the case that we've chosen has a slim uh, drive housing, so you can't, actually can't use a full-size drive. Uh, the cool thing is that actually for DVD drives, uh, the prices on the slim versions have dropped a lot, so it uh, makes this much more affordable and also allows us to use a very small case because, well, it's a small DVD drive. The one uh, caveat for that is that it actually is made for use uh, in, like, as a replacement drive for laptops, so it actually has a specialized uh, smaller, I believe this is micro SATA. Please, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can correct this. Uh, I think it's mini SATA actually. Mini SATA connector right there for power and data. And for that, we've got this uh, add on cable here, and that's going to allow us to properly plug that into the motherboard as well as the power supply. We have storage, of course. This is a Seagate Barracuda one terabyte hard drive, and that's going to be our primary uh, operating system drive as well as storage. Uh, we also have aftermarket CPU cooler because I much prefer aftermarket CPU coolers uh, to the stock ones that come with the processors. This is also going to give us uh, better temperatures, lower noise, and uh, will actually allow us to do some overclocking or allow you to do some overclocking if you're so inclined and uh, you happen to put this system together. This is the Cooler Master Gemin 2 M4. Uh, oh, I also forgot the DVD is the, uh, wait, what it, which is this again? Ah, this is the SN208 uh, Slim DVD burner. Finally, <laughs> we have our, uh, our actual chassis. Uh, this is the chassis and power supply in one. This is the Silverstone Sugo SG05. It's a new version that has USB 3.0. Now, apart from peripherals such as a keyboard, mouse, and monitor, uh, to complete this build, you might need an operating system such as Windows 7, so bear that in mind. Uh, also, as far as tools for the build, I simply have a Phillips head screwdriver. Uh, I've also got a few twist ties here because I like to hoard those and have a nice uh, stash available to me. Uh, apart from that, everything else you need for the build should be included with the hardware. Now I'm going through and just unboxing parts and getting everything prepped here so I can start theorizing how the layout is going to go um, because cable management is always important. You should always think ahead. This is just the outer housing of the case. And uh, one little quirk to this build. When we originally parted it out, this version of this case was not available. That was just, uh, just a few weeks ago. They came out with a new version that has USB 3.0 uh, front on the front, which is really cool, nice feature. However, the motherboard that we chose uh, does not have a 20-pin header like this one. 
to plug into and actually enable these USB 3.0 port ports. Silverstone was nice enough to provide a little uh, adapter here for backwards compatibility. So actually the plug in the case plugs into this. So what we're going to end up doing is plugging this USB 2.0 header into the motherboard. So that will enable these front uh, USB 3.0 uh, plugs right there. However, they're going to be running at USB 2.0 speeds. Uh, that doesn't mean we won't have USB 3.0. We're just going to be uh, using the USB 3.0 that's on the back of the motherboard. Going to jump straight to the build next. Bear in mind, I'm going to walk you guys through this step by step. But if you are a first time computer builder, you might want to jump over to our How to Build a Computer three part series. That'll sort of guide you through the basics. First off, I always like to start with the input output shield for the motherboard. Uh, because it's something that I, I admit I have forgotten in the past and if you install an entire system and forget the input output shield it's kind of a pain because you have to uninstall everything. I'm going to pop out the drive cage next to make sure there's plenty of room to work inside the case and next we're going to work on the motherboard. Here I'm actually going to have to use some pliers uh, as opposed to just the Phillips head screwdriver and that is to remove the pre-installed AMD mounting solution because we do have a custom cooler that we're going to be installing here. AMD CPU installation is pretty simple. Just raise up the lever, line up the gold triangle in the corner of the CPU with the triangle indicator on the socket, drop it straight down into the socket, and then close the lever. Next we're going to work on the aftermarket heatsink fan. You will definitely want to reference the instruction manual because this is probably one of the more complex parts. We actually ended up doing this twice uh, because we were testing a couple different installations. Uh, here's a place where I'm actually going to recommend going against the instruction manual. So after you have installed the retention arms, I'm actually going to recommend uh, bending them down slightly to make sure that they protrude a little bit more through the motherboard to the back. Uh, of course, you will want to pop in your memory just to make sure that uh, you have access to that um, before you install the aftermarket heatsink fan. And then you have uh, rubber stoppers as well as a universal backplate. The rubber stoppers uh, you usually would pop onto the top of the motherboard. I'm actually going to recommend you put them on the back. First, don't forget your thermal paste. Uh, you can do this upside down. So with the heatsink fan uh, on the bottom, you can drop the motherboard down on top. And here is where I'm actually going to put these stoppers on straight down on the back of the motherboard rather than the front. What that's going to do is provide a little bit more spacing between that universal back plate and the motherboard because there are some components there. And uh, as you can see here with those rubber stoppers on, uh, we do need a bit of threading to poke out through that and that's why I bent those arms a little bit. Uh, but with the threading out, I was able to get the screws on. You can tighten them down with the included socket. Uh, you don't want to over tighten these, but make sure they are good and snug. You can put a little bit of compression on those stoppers should give you nice good contact with the CPU and the base plate of the heatsink fan. Installing the motherboard into the case is fairly simple. It's mini ITX, so you only have four motherboard standoffs to worry about. Line that up with the input output shield at the back of the computer case, and you should be good to go. Just uh, find these little silver screws, come along with the case, and you're gonna tighten down all four of those. Of course, don't forget to uh, plug in your CPU heatsink fan. I should have done that before, but uh, still accessible from this point. Next up, power supply cables. We have a 20 plus four pin cable. We're gonna plug that in right there for the main motherboard power. We also have a little splitter, four or eight pin supplemental CPU power. Make sure you use the right side of that. It's keyed, so it should only go in one way. Now's a good time to plug in that front intake fan on the case. You also want to plug in your front panel connectors. This is the biggest pain in the butt part of the case because it's hard to get to and they're small, but uh, you want to line those up according to the grid. Uh, you can reference the manual if you're not sure what's what. Also here you have your front panel audio connector. It's a little, little yellow block. This goes right next to the slot for the video card. Just make sure you bunch that cable down so the video card can actually install on top. Here's USB. Again, uh, we're using an adapter here, so we're going to plug this into USB 2.0. That will give us USB 2.0 speeds, but it will also enable the front panel USB 3.0 plugs. We're just going to use a flathead screwdriver here to pop off the front bezel. Uh, you want to work at the metal piece that's uh, installed here. That should just bend off uh, at each side. Remove the front cover, and that will let you line up the slim optical drive properly with the front of the case. Slim optical drive mounts in this tray. I lined it up at the front of the case first to make sure that it's matching and then I installed one screw just so it won't slide around. Then I popped that tray out of the case one more time to install the other four screws and finally back into the case to install the four screws to hold the tray in place. 
Here's that micro SATA converter cable. Just plug that into the back of the optical drive and then route it down into the case. Next up we have the uh, hard drive. Again, that's got its own little cage here. Uh, at this point you might also consider an SSD if you were going to do a little upgrade to this. An SSD would be a great addition. It would go in right above that uh, 3.5 inch drive. That's pretty basic to install and then to drop into place and screw in. Next up I'm going to be plugging in the power and data cables for the optical drive as well as the hard drive. And then also routing those serial ATA cables down to plug into the motherboard. All the motherboard serial ATA plugs are the same so you can plug them into any of those four white ports. Here's a little cable management. I'm going to get this little group of cables off to the side and uh, cinch it all up nice and tight. Try to get out of the way and also give me some additional room to install the video card. Removing the back PCI slots for the video card. Uh, simply remove the few screws and pop those out. And then next up is the video card installation. This might take a little bit of uh, pushing to get it into place, but it'll drop straight down into that blue socket. Also remember that you have a six pin PCI Express power connector. You will need to plug into that, so I've set that aside. And here's a little gap where those little cables for the USB and front panel audio are gonna feed through, so I'm just gonna tuck those down so they can fit through there. With the video card installed, I'm just gonna reinstall the retention bracket for that. Also gonna tuck away that PCI Express power cable, plug in the six pin, and then we are essentially good to go. Well everyone, I'm happy to say that our mini mobile gaming PC build has gone quite smoothly. I've now had the opportunity to load a uh, copy of Windows onto it. So right now we're running, running Windows 7 64-bit. Bear in mind that is sold separately from the uh, combo that's available. And uh, yeah, it's good to go. I have updated uh, Windows updates, also loaded the drivers that I downloaded from the ASRock website. And I wanted to come clean with you guys because I gave you sort of a list of tools at the beginning which was just a screwdriver, and I kind of cheated and used, used some other stuff. So, uh, especially for your first time builder, here's just some stuff that's uh, handy to have on hand, if that makes sense. Uh, scissors, of course, very important for clipping off things that need to be clipped off, opening up stuff. Uh, I specifically use them because I also pulled out some zip ties. Uh, I love zip ties because they're really good for cable management. Uh, they're a bit harder to reuse, so typically they're one-time use unless you have a really tiny little thing to go in there and back that off. So uh, if you have any of these handy, they work great. If not, twist ties work just as well. Uh, I used a flathead screwdriver a few times to um, pry off the front bezel, for example, uh, and uh, that sort of thing. I used a smaller screwdriver, Phillips head, um, because some of the screws are smaller and you need a smaller screwdriver. And then you guys probably saw me use these pliers, uh, which I mainly used to help remove the stock AMD cooling bracket that's on the motherboard to install our Cooler Master Gemin 2 M4. That said, uh, system's running great. It's been totally perfect so far. I'm going to lean way close to this so you can hear. It's not too loud at all. I've done a little bit of gaming on this so far and I've also run some benchmarks and uh, even when the fans spin up, which it didn't need to do very much, uh, the CPU has been idling maybe 30, 31, which is, uh, which is quite good. Uh, GPU also just in that range got up to about 60 plus max while I was actually running some games and uh, since I mentioned benchmarks uh, just a few of them here but let's take a closer look at those results. First off here is the Windows Experience Index and you'll notice our overall score of 5.9 however that is simply the result of our primary hard drive. We have uh, the Seagate one terabyte mechanical hard drive in here, which is a very solid drive, however, not as fast as some SSDs. So if you were gonna do an add-on for this build, uh, I would recommend popping in an SSD. You have a specific little 2.5 inch bay for it, and uh, you can use that to run, to install your operating system onto, and then use a Seagate drive uh, for storage. Uh, running off of it, it doesn't have quite as good a score, uh, but still perfectly capable of running everything I've thrown at it. Uh, processor got 7.3 for calculations per second, memory is at 7.4, and graphics are 7770, has been performing quite well and gave us a score of 7.6. Next up, I ran Passmark, which is sort of an overall 
system benchmark. Uh, the Performance Test 7.0 is free to download if you guys want to try it out. Uh, it, got, it gave me an overall score of 1581.6, which is quite solid for a machine uh, of this uh, price level. And uh, there's all the individual results as well, if you want to take a look at those. I also ran 3D Mark 11, and I ran it in a couple different modes. So we ran performance mode, uh, which does a slightly lower resolution. We got a score in performance mode of 3,281, graphics score of 3,203, physics score 3,825, and then the combined score 3,192. So again, very solid scores on that. Uh, the system is going to be great for doing gaming. Uh, you should be able to do most games at high resolution. You might not be able to do everything at ultra, especially if you're playing new games like Battlefield 3. Uh, but if you tweak the settings a little bit, you should at least be able to get playable frame rates in the 30 to 60 frames per second range. Uh, here's the extreme score. We did break 1,000 on that, so uh, very nice there. 1,778 was our total score. Uh, again, I did do some temperature monitoring with some of these tests. The most... Actually, I have them in the other, I did another run with that for some temperatures. Here they are over on the right. Probably a little hard for you guys to read, but uh, CPU max temp was 44.5 running uh, 3D Mark. And the, it's down here, the GPU max temp was 57. So everything well within range. Uh, again, temperature wise, nothing ever got up uh, high enough that the fans had to spin up very loud. This, this system stays nice and quiet. It has sort of a soft whoosh uh, sound to it, but uh, very quiet system overall. That's all for my benchmarks. Finally, let's do a quick game demo. I'm going to throw up WoW here because I happen to have it on hand. And uh, expansion's coming out soon, so maybe you guys are interested. Alright guys, so here's World of Warcraft, and uh, I know this isn't exactly the newest game, but well, lots of people still play it, so I happened to have it on my thumb drive and popped it in here. I'm in Orgrimmar right now. I'm getting uh, between 30, 45 frames per second. This is at 1080. I have all the settings up at the ultra preset, so it can't get much higher. Multi-sampling's at 2x. That's the only thing I'd bump up more, but that's pretty uh, hard on a lot of graphics cards. So uh, I haven't dipped below 30 at all, and typically in Orgrimmar, at least I, you often have lower frame rates due to ping, but uh, when I get out, it's actually creeping up and getting above 60 frames per second. So uh, very playable. And again, this is at ultra, so uh, you can tweak with those if you happen to get into a situation where you find your frame rate drops when there's more activity on the screen. Uh, but there it is, a quick game demonstration on our little mini mobile gaming rig. And that's going to wrap it up for this video, everyone. Hope you learned a little bit more about building a small rig such as this one. Uh, this is the first combo slash build video that we've done so far so we're going to try to keep doing these on a regular basis uh, come out with cool builds that you guys might be interested in uh, this one is particularly designed to hit a nice low price point as far as the hardware goes also to be small and portable uh, so especially if you guys are heading back to school you can take it on the go with you and it won't take up much space in your bags or on the plane or wherever you might be going Thanks a lot for watching this video. If you'd like to see more, you can check out our, our Newegg YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Newegg. And uh, we'll see you all next time on Newegg TV.